NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft containing a six by nine inch gold plated aluminum placard with this graphical image on here depicting the sun and our solar system with precise spacing, hydrogen isotope spin, a male and female form, and the spacecraft itself. And this book centers around the idea of extraterrestrial civilizations acquiring this satellite, the entirety of it, not just the placard, and trying to make sense of where human beings are located in the universe, since the Earth and our sun is not even visible from four light years away. We become invisibly dim. The sun is a GV2 class star and is actually relatively small and low output and our entire solar system becomes completely non-observable to the human eye sensitivity level just a few light years away from Earth. So any extraterrestrial civilization that can locate us using the satellite is going to need to be able to figure out from this depiction where we are within the Milky Way. And he explores that in the first three or four chapters, but today we're going to be reading from chapter five. A reading from The Cosmic Connection and Extraterrestrial Perspective by Carl Sagan. Chapter five, towards the end. I do not believe that anyone alive today is wise enough to know what such a future society will be like. There may be many different alternatives, each potentially more successful than the pitiful small variety that face us today. A related problem is that non-Western, non-technological societies viewing the power and great material wealth of the West are making great strides to emulate us in course of which many ancient traditions, worldviews, and ways of life are being abandoned. For we all know some of the alternatives being abandoned contain elements of precisely the alternatives we're seeking. There must be some way to preserve the adaptive elements of our society painfully worked out through thousands of years of sociological evolution, while at the same time coming to grips with modern technology. The principal immediate problem is to spread that technological achievement while maintaining cultural diversity. An opinion sometimes encountered is that the problem is technology itself. I maintain that this is the misuse of technology by the elected or self-appointed leaders of society and not technology itself that is at fault. We, were we to return to a more primitive agricultural endeavor, as some of us have urged, and abandon modern agricultural technology, we would be condemning hundreds of millions of people to death. There is no escape from technology on our planet the problem is to use it wisely. For quite similar reasons, technology must be a major factor in planetary societies older than ours. I think it is likely that societies that are immensely wiser and more benign than ours are, nevertheless more highly technological than we. We are at an epochal transitionary moment in history of life on Earth. There is no other time as risky, but no other time as promising for the future of life on our planet. Chapter three, a message from Earth. Mankind's first serious attempt to communicate with an extraterrestrial civilization occurred March 3rd, 1972, with the launching of the Pioneer 10 spacecraft from Cape Kennedy. Pioneer 10 was the first space vehicle designed to explore the environment of the planet Jupiter and earlier in its voyage, the asteroids that lie between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Its orbit was not disturbed by an errant asteroid, the safety factor was estimated at 20 to 1. Its approach to Jupiter in late December of 73, and then accelerated by Jupiter's gravity to become the first man-made object to leave the solar system. Its exit velocity is about seven miles per second. Pioneer 10 is the speediest object launched to date by mankind, but space is very empty. The distances between the stars are vast. In the next 10 billion years, Pioneer 10 will not enter the planetary system of any other star, even assuming that all the stars in the galaxy have such planetary systems. This spacecraft will take about 80,000 years merely to travel the distance to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away. But Pioneer 10 is not directed into the vicinity of any near star. Instead, it will be traveling towards a point on the celestial sphere near the boundary of the constellation Taurus and Orion, where there are no nearby objects. It's conceivable that the spacecraft will be encountered by an extraterrestrial civilization 
only if such a civilization has an extensive capability for interstellar space flight and is able to intercept and recover such a silent space probe. Chapter 5 Experiments in Utopias In assessing the likelihood of advanced technological civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy, the most important factor is the one about which we know least, the lifetime of such a civilization. If civilizations destroy themselves rapidly after reaching the technological phase, at any given moment like now, there may be very few of them for us to contact. If on the other hand a small fraction of civilizations learn to live with weapons of mass destruction and avoid both natural and self-generated catastrophes, then the number of civilizations for us to communicate with at any given moment may be very large. This assessment is one reason we're concerned about the lifetime of civilizations. There is a more pressing reason, of course, for personal reasons, we hope that the lifetime of our own civilization will be long. There is probably no epoch in the history of mankind that has undergone so much and so many variety of changes as the present time. 200 years ago, information could be sent from one city to another no faster than by horse. Today, the information can be sent via telephone, telegraph, radio, or television at the velocity of light. In 200 years, the speed of communication has increased by a factor of 30 million. We believe that no corresponding future advance since messages cannot, we believe, be sent faster than the velocity of light. 200 years ago, it took as long to go from Liverpool to London as it does to go from Earth to the Moon. Similar changes have occurred in the energy resources available to our civilization in the amount of information that is stored and processed in methods of food production and the distribution and the synthesis of new materials in the concentration of population from countryside to the cities in vast increase in population, in improved medical practice, and enormous social upheaval. Our instinct and emotions are those of the hunter-gatherer ancestor of a million years ago, but our society is astonishingly different than that of a million years ago. In times of slow change, the insight and skills learned by one generation are useful, tried, and adaptive, and are gladly received when passed down to the next generation. But in times like today, when society changes significantly in less than a human lifetime, the parental insights no longer have unquestioned validity for the young. The so-called generation gap is consequence of the rate of social and technological change. Even within a human lifetime, the change is so great that many people are alienated from their own society. Margaret Mead has described older people today as involuntary immigrants from the past to the present. Old economic assumptions, old methods of determining po political leaders, old methods of distributing resources, old methods of communicating information from the government to the people and vice versa, all of these may have once been valid or useful or at least somewhat adaptive, but today no longer have survival value at all. Old oppressive and chauvinistic attitudes amongst the races between the sexes and between economic groups are being justifiably challenged. The fabric of society throughout the world is ripping. At the same time, there are vested interests opposed to change. These include individuals in power who have much to gain in the short run by maintaining the old ways, even if their children have much to lose in the long run. There are individuals who are unable in their middle years to change the attitudes inoculated to their youth. The situation is a very difficult one. The rate of change cannot continue indefinitely. As the example of the rate of change of communication indicates, limits must eventually be reached. We cannot communicate faster than the velocity of light. We cannot have a population larger than the Earth's resources and economic distribution facilities can maintain. Whatever the solutions to be achieved, hundreds of years from now, the Earth is unlikely still to be experiencing great social stress and change. We will have reached some solution to our present problems. The question is, which solution? In science, a situation as complicated as this, as this is difficult to treat theoretically. We do not understand all the factors that influence our society and therefore cannot make reliable predictions about what changes are desirable. There are too many complex interactions. Ecology has been called the subversive science because every time a serious effort to preserve a feature of the environment is made, it runs into enormous numbers of social and economically vested interests. The same is true every time we attempt to make a major change in anything that is wrong. The change runs through society as a whole. It's difficult to isolate small fragments of the society and change them without having profound influences on the rest of society. When theory is not adequate in science, the only realistic approach is experimental. Experiment is the touchstone of science on which the theories are framed. It is the court of the last resort. What is clearly needed are experimental societies. 
There is a good biological precedent for this idea. In the evolution of life, there are innumerable cases when an organism was clearly dominant, highly specialized, and perfectly acclimatized to its environment, but the environment changed and that organism died. It is for this reason that nature employs mutations. The vast majority of mutations are deleterious or lethal. The mutated species are less adapted than normal types, but one in a thousand or one in ten thousand mutations has a slight advantage over its parents. These muta mutations breed true, and the mutant organism is now slightly better adapted. Social mutations, it seems to me, are what we need. Perhaps because of a hoary science fiction tradition that mutants are ugly and hateful, it might be better to use another term. We should be encouraging social, economic, and political experimentation on a massive scale in all countries. Instead, the opposite seems to be occurring. In countries such as the United States and the Soviet Union, the official policy is to discourage significant experimentation because it is, of course, unpopular with the majority. The practical consequence is vigorous popular disapproval of significant variation. Young urban idealists immersed in a drug culture with dress styles considered bizarre by conventional standards and with no prior knowledge of agriculture are unlikely to succeed in establishing utopian agricultural communities in the American Southwest even without local harassment. Yet such experimental communities throughout the world have been subjected to hostility and violence by their more conventional neighbors. In some cases, the vigilantes are enraged because they themselves have only within the previous generation been accepted into the conventional system. We should not be surprised then if experimental communities fail, only a small fraction of mutations succeed. But the advanced social mutations have over biological mutations is that individuals learn the participants in unsuccessful community communal experiments are able to assess the reasons for failure and can participate in later experiments that attempt to avoid the causes of initial failure. There should not be only popular approval for such experiments, but also official government support for them. Volunteers for such experiments in utopia facing long odds for the benefits of society as a whole, I hope, be thought of as men and women of exemplary courage. They are cutting edge of the future. One day there will arise an experimental community that works much more efficiently than the polygot, rubbery, hand-patched society we're living in. A viable alternative will then be before us. I do not believe that anyone alive today is wise enough to know what a future society will be like. There may be many different alternatives, each potentially more successful than the pitiful small variety that face us today. A related problem is that non-Western, non-technological societies viewing the power and great material wealth of the West are making great strides to emulate us, in the course of which many ancient traditions, worldviews, and ways of life are being abandoned. For all we know, some of the alternatives being abandoned contain elements of precisely the alternatives we are seeking. There must be some way to preserve the adaptive elements of our society painfully worked out through thousands of years of sociological evolution while at the same time coming to grips with modern technology. The principal immediate problem is to spread the technological achievements while maintaining cultural diversity. An opinion sometimes encountered is that the problem is technology itself I maintain that it's the misuse of technology by the elected or self-appointed leaders of societies and not technology itself that is at fault. Were we, return, were we to return to a more primitive agricultural endeavor, as some have urged, and abandon our modern our agricultural technology, we would be condemning hundreds of millions of people to death. There is no escape from technology in our planet. The problem is to use it wisely. For quite similar reasons, technology must be a major factor in planetary societies older than ours. I think it's likely that societies that are immensely wiser and more benign than ours are nevertheless more highly technological than we. We are at an epochal transitionary moment in the history of life on Earth. There is no other time as risky, but no other time as promising for the future of life on our planet.